Hey guys, how's it going today? Going with the squeeze brain today because at the beginning of this video, maybe your brain's gonna feel like this. But by the end, oh, oh no, what happened? I'm not squeezing anymore. The idea is your brain's gonna be big at the end. I got some gnat bites when I went to Antelope Island. Can you see them? Stupid biting gnats. They even warned us, but I didn't believe them. All right, here we go. So last week, we started the whole conversation about hypothesis testing with three research questions. Today, we're going to be moving on to what are called a difference in means and a difference in proportion tests, which are very similar mechanically, but it allows us to really broaden the range of research questions and really ask more relevant research questions than we could before when we were doing simple hypothesis testing. So let's just go over these three question examples real quick and think about how they're different. So now for A, I have is Amazon stock true average return greater than Tesla stock true average return? So you might recall last time we asked a similar question, we said, is Amazon stock true average return greater than 5% per year? But now we're comparing Amazon stock to Tesla stock. So one thing I want you to take from this question is here we have two unknowns. Before we just had one, we just had Amazon stock true average return. We don't know what the true average population return is. And we were asking, well, is it greater than 5%? But in this question, we're asking about one true average we don't know, Amazon stock, and comparing that to a different true average we don't know, Tesla stock. So that's going to be the question, the type of question we can ask now that has two unknowns. And this might be a more relevant comparison because before we said, hey, let's just pretend we'll make 5% no matter what in this other um, investment. But now we can actually compare what are more realistic two unknown investments to each other. Another type of question that might be relevant here is that the case fatality rate for coronavirus less in warm climates than in cold climates. So what this question is asking, case fatality rate is actually a proportion. It's the number of people who pass away from coronavirus divided by the number of people who had positive tests. So that's called the case fatality rate. And that's actually a proportion. Here we're saying, well, is that different in warm and cold climates? That could be a really relevant public health question, as you can imagine. So maybe you take a sample from the UK during March, which is much cooler than Australia during March, and you compare the case fatality rates across those two countries. Again, here we have two unknowns. We're not given a number as a basis for comparison. The last one is the true average salary of an accounting major different than the true average salary of an economics major. So maybe one that's relevant to any of you who might be thinking about different majors. You could take a sample of people who majored in accounting and a sample of people that majored in economics and compare what their salaries are to try to answer this question about two unknowns. One note I want to make, I often say true average, but we've talked a lot about the population average in the past. I use those interchangeably. So when I say true average, I mean population average and vice versa. That's that unknown number that we're going to try to guess. So that's mu in the case of averages or p in the case of proportions, right? Those are those unknown population parameters that we're trying to get guess or make inferences about. I'm gonna mention a couple of side notes here before I get on to setting up hypotheses for these questions because there's some new things we need to understand and those are gonna be about the sampling distributions of differences in means. That's a difference between two means, right? X bar one from some sample minus X bar two. That's why it's called a difference in means tests or difference in proportions tests. Notice these are samples. So I could go take one sample from population one and another sample from population two. For example, coronavirus cases in Australia and the United Kingdom, for example. And then I could take the difference between those two means. 
And every time I did that, if I took new random samples, I'd get a different, a different difference in every sample, right? Same with proportions, sample proportions, the same thing would happen. So if I compare the approval rating of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump by calling a bunch of people, asking them, I get P1, the proportion of people who favor Donald Trump, the proportion of people that favor Hillary Clinton is the second one. I could take the difference in those to get the difference in favorability ratings. But if I did that with different samples over and over again, I would get different numbers each time. Well, where would these differences be centered if we were doing X bars? They'd be centered at the truth, luckily. And look what happens. So these will actually be centered at mu1 minus mu2. So that's a good thing because that's the truth. That's the true difference in the population means, which we're trying to guess by taking a sample of each population and guessing the truth. All right? So it's a bell shape just like we had before. It's a normal distribution. And so that's a good thing because that drives all the other stuff we're thinking about, like making confidence intervals or doing hypothesis tests. Similarly down here for proportions, the same thing happens. We get a bell curve and guess where that bell curve is centered. It's centered at the truth, P1 minus P2. So now the only thing that's changed is we're trying to guess the difference between two numbers instead of just one number at a time. Just one mu at a time is what we were doing before. Now we're trying to guess the difference between two mu's. Why do we want the difference based on these? Well, think about question A. Is Amazon stock true average return greater than Tesla stock true average return? Well, if mu Amazon, the true average return of Amazon, minus mu Tesla, the true average return of Tesla, was greater than zero, that would imply that Amazon stock's true return is greater than Tesla stock's. So we can always turn these questions into a question about the differences in the population quantities. We're gonna use sample means and sample proportions to guess those. So, we want to know how those guesses are going to be distributed around the truth. Okay? So one other thing, of course, we like to know two things about the distributions of random variables. So one thing we'd like to know is the expected value. Well, the expected value of x bar 1 minus x bar 2 equals mu 1 minus mu 2. So the average of the average differences is the truth. That's why this distribution right here is centered at mu one minus mu two. So that basically says, on average, if we did this over and over again, we'd get what we want, the truth. The other thing we like to know about these distribution is how spread out they are. So what is the standard error x bar one minus x bar two. So that just stands for the standard error of a difference in means. The book calls it sigma x bar one minus x bar two, because another way to think about the standard error is it's the standard deviation, sigma, of a statistic. In our new statistic that we're dealing with right now, instead of just one sample average, it's the difference between two. And it turns out that this guy equals the square root of S1 squared, the sample variance of the first sample, divided by N1, the sample size of the first sample, plus S2 squared over N2. So those are variances now, because remember that the standard deviation squared is the variance. So when I write S1 squared, I just mean the variance of those numbers. And so that formula is available in the book if you forget it. I don't want you to necessarily memorize those formulas, but it's good to know that one thing that's changing when we move on to differences in means is that we get a different formula for the standard error. We have a little bit more uncertainty because we're looking at two unknown quantities 
X bar one and X bar two. So these standard errors are gonna be a little bit bigger than if we were just dealing with one unknown, one X bar. All right, so down here with the proportions, the expected value of P1 bar minus P2 bar equals the truth, P1 minus P2. So that's why this one's centered at P1 minus P2. And the standard error sigma P bar one minus P bar two is a little bit different too. That's kind of a longer formula that I'm not gonna draw here, but you can get that in your book. It's very similar to the one when we're just looking at P bar, but it combines those two formulas in a similar way to the way that these individual standard errors for X bar one and X bar two are being combined. So it's just a little bit bigger of a formula. You can do it in Excel. Um, I don't think I'll make you memorize that formula, but it's a good, for the homework, you'll definitely have to do it. So I encourage you to just get your book out and have the formula in front of you while you're doing that. Now, one last thing about these differences in means tests that we're gonna look at is sometimes, usually we have unmatched samples. That's where the power of doing difference in means really comes from, or that, not the power, but most examples are unpaired. So for example, actually example A is gonna be a match test. Sorry, I should have said matched and unmatched. They're also called paired and unpaired, but the book use match, uses matched and unmatched. A is actually an example of a matched one but B is gonna be an example of an unmatched sample. So I have to measure these CFRs with the proportions separately in the United Kingdom and Australia. I have to go and count the total number of people in Australia who have gotten coronavirus and divide that by the total number of people who have died of coronavirus. So that's one number, that's P1 bar for Australia. Now I have to do the same thing separately in the UK. So I'm in this situation where I'm measuring these two things separately. So basically, so an example, EG, is the CFR for coronavirus. You can't match observations in the sample. Oops. Now let's think about, let's use the problem A for a match sample and think about how we might collect this data. So if we're looking at stock returns, maybe we could do, go back to 1990. Actually, no, we can't go back to 1990 because I don't think Tesla existed in 1990. Whoa, I'm old. Let's do 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. So for each of those years, I'll have an Amazon return and a Tesla return, okay? Actually, I'm gonna give myself a little bit more space there. So we have matched, we'll have Amazon return and Tesla return, because I want to keep myself a column over here to show you guys what's going on. So say in 2005, we had 11%, we had 9%, and then we had 7%, 6%, and we had 12%, 8%. Two thousand eight was a bad year, so we had minus six percent, minus four percent. So notice that I could actually combine in two thousand five these two numbers together to make a difference. Okay. Now in the first year, it's going to be two percent because eleven percent minus nine percent is two percent. So in that year. Amazon was 2% higher. 2006, 1%, 2007, 4%, 2008, uh, negative 2%, right? 
So now I have a random sample of differences right here. So actually, if you have matched the data, you could go ahead and say, call this D bar for your estimate of the difference. And now you have an estimate of the difference and it's just one column of data and you could go back to chapter nine and do a simple hypothesis test by comparing D bar to zero. Because the question, the null hypothesis is that on average, these numbers are less than equal to zero. And so if you have a matched sample, you can basically go back to simple hypothesis testing. Okay, the book talks about that a little bit too. But in most cases for this, this chapter, we'll deal with unmatched samples because again, you've already learned how to do matched because if you can do this type of matching by putting them together, then you could just have one variable for your simple hypothesis test. Now, some other examples, just because I think the best way to differentiate between matched and unmatched. One example I like is imagine if I'm trying to test a cholesterol pill and I take a random sample of 50 people and give it to them. And then I take a different random sample of 50 people and I do not give it to them. I could compare their the cholesterol in the treatment group, the ones I gave the cholesterol pill to, and the control group, the ones I didn't to, by taking the sample average cholesterol in each group separately. That would be an unmatched sample because there's no way to match the people in the groups together. Now imagine doing it a different way. I could call 50 people into my office, take their cholesterol, and then give them the pill and take exactly the same person's cholesterol after a week after taking the pill or something. And now I have a matched sample. Because for example, I gave Gavin, I got his cholesterol, then I gave him a pill, and then I gave him a cholesterol again. So instead of looking at those numbers separately, I could take Gavin's cholesterol after taking the pill and subtract it before and then find the change in Gavin's cholesterol. And then I would have a matched sample. The only reason I could do that is because I have an observation from the same person. The cholesterol observations are matched by person. So that's an example of where you'd have unmatched versus matched samples. Now, side note three I wanted to mention, now that we know about the sampling distributions of differences in means and differences in proportions, we can create confidence intervals. What we want to remember about confidence intervals is the margin of error always has the same formula. How many SEs do I need to go out to maintain 95%, for example, if we were doing a 95% confidence interval, of OBS within observations of whatever statistic, like X bar or P bar, but now X bar one minus X bar two, within to maintain 95% of OBS within the true mean. So that's long, I know it's wordy, but this is one of the ideas that it's helpful to think about it in that long-winded way every time. So this is either gonna be a critical T or a critical Z, right? Because those numbers are the numbers that tell us how far we need to go out in confidence intervals. So we multiply how many standard A errors I need to go out by my standard error. So this is where we just use the formula for our particular standard error right here. So it's always a critical T or a critical Z multiplied by a standard error. So for example, if I wanted a 95% 
confidence interval for the true difference in proportions, so maybe this is the case fatality rate one, well, I go get first, calculate P bar one minus P bar two. That's our point estimate of the difference. So we go get our case fatality rate from Australia and the United Kingdom and then take their difference and that is our point estimate of the difference. And then two, calculate margin of error. So I would want to get, so we're using proportions, so that means we can use a Z. And I would want the Z with area 0.975 to its left, right? So I could get that by doing, for example, norm dot dist. 0.97501, and that would give me the number from a Z distribution with a 97.5% to its left. Because if I have a 95% confidence interval, I want 2.5% in each tail. So I go to Z.95, and then below I would go to Z.025. That's how far I have to go to the left. That's the critical Z. That number represents how many standard errors we need to go away from the middle of the distribution, which our guess of the middle is right there, by the way, in order to maintain 95%. And then we would multiply that by our SE, P1 bar minus P2 bar. And that, by the way, is going to be so I didn't write this down above, but I'll write it now. P1 bar, if we don't know the population or have a guess of it. So we have some sample size that we're doing in Australia to get the case fatality rate. So notice that's the same as the standard error before, but we have to go ahead and add that over N2. So that's how we calculate the standard error. And now our, our margin of error would be these two numbers multiplied by each other. So Z.975, that's how many standard errors I need to go out right here. Calculate that, that's my standard error. Standard error P1 bar minus P2 bar. And that's the, that is the margin of error. And then CI lower would equal your estimate, your point estimate of the difference, minus the margin of error. CI upper will equal P1 bar minus P2 bar, your estimate plus the margin of error. So all of that stuff is pretty much the same as before. What's changed is now your estimate is a difference and how you calculate the standard error is a little bit different. If you're doing a T distribution, like this, because you don't know the population standard deviation and you're doing a difference in means, then you will need to calculate the degrees of freedom. I think you just have to do that for a couple problems in the homework. I will not force you to do that on the quiz. If anything, I'll just tell you what the degrees of freedom are for a problem. All right. So those are some side notes. This is going to be a longer video. Sorry about that. But let's go back and remind ourselves of where we started. We started with talking about these three research questions, and we just had to point out some new things now that we're doing differences in means and proportions. And these are all examples of differences in means and proportions. So now let's figure out how to write out our hypothesis tests. So for the hypothesis testing part, step two in any hypothesis test is setting up hypotheses, right? So we have HA. This is the, or I'll just say alternative hypothesis gives 
yes answer to research question. And that's H A, null hypothesis gives no answer to research question. And that is designated H O. Now we usually write HO first, so let's do this for our Amazon Tesla question. So first I'm gonna define mu. In simple hypothesis testing, you only have one. It becomes kind of more important to define these. Now that we have two unknown quantities, I'll draw, try to draw a better mu. Mu A, I'm gonna let that equal true or let's call it population average Amazon return. Mu T, what do you think that's going to equal? Population average Tesla return. So we start, we always write our null hypothesis first, and then our alternative hypothesis. And I'm gonna have mu a, mu a, so that's true average Amazon return. Now let's go look at the question again real quick. The alternative is true, and the answer is yes to this red question. So if Amazon stock is greater than Tesla, the answer is yes. So for the alternative, Amazon greater than Tesla. That's how we'd write that in math based on these definitions, right? And then the null will be the opposite, less than or equal to mu t. Okay? So if this is true, the answer to the question will be no. If this is true, the answer is yes. So define, deciding which one of these is true will allow us to answer the question. Now notice that we could rewrite these as mu a minus mu t. Go away. Is less than or equal to zero. And h a mu a minus mu t is greater than zero. Okay, now, because I just subtracted mu t from both sides of each of these inequalities, mu t minus mu t is zero, mu a minus mu t is mu a minus mu t. Now we're in a world that looks like this distribution we drew. We don't know what this quantity is, but that's what our question is about. But we know we can take a sample right here that will be distributed like this to try to answer those questions. Okay? So the next step in this hypothesis would be to go and calculate. So step three in this one, which we'll cover more detail in the next video, would be to go calculate X bar A, the average of the Amazon returns in our sample, minus, or sorry, let's say we would just collect X bar T, and then we would get be, with those, we could calculate x bar a minus x bar t. Then we'd calculate standard error x bar a minus x bar t. Then we would create a z or t statistic. Right? Because that's what's always the next step. We'd calculate these these values with our sample before we were just doing individual sample averages, but now we get two. We get the standard error of those two. Z or T is going to be Z something like X bar A minus X bar T minus zero, by the way. Where's that zero coming from? Well, that is like mu naught. The book calls that D naught now, by the way, for difference the null difference is zero. 
because that's the number that divides our null and alternative hypothesis. And then we would divide this by SE, X bar A minus X bar T. So now we will have converted our data into a Z distribution or a T if we had to, if we had to use S. But at that point, we pretty much have everything we need. We could compare this to a critical value or we could get a P value and compare it to an alpha. So that's kind of just foreshadowing what's gonna happen next time. But let's set up, for an example, our blue research question. Is the CFR, case fatality rate, for coronavirus less in warm climates than cold climates? So let's define our variables. P, W equals CFR, the case fatality rate in warm climates. And that's the true proportion, right? True population CFR. PC, true CFR cold climates. We're asking if it's less in warm than cold, so HO, H, A, P, W, P, W. Yes, alternative hypothesis would be true if the proportion in warm climates was less than the proportion in cold climates. This has to be the opposite. So there is our alternative and null hypothesis. Remember, we could write those as P, W minus P, C greater than or equal to zero. PW minus PC less than zero. And now we're dealing with a quantity, an unknown quantity that sits at the middle of the distribution of our guesses at that quantity. And then we can do hypothesis testing. So those are both one-tailed tests, right? This is the first time I've shown an example with a proportion, but really everything's the same. The only difference is we're using P instead of mu. Let's look at the last one. We have our economic salary different than accounting, or sorry, accounting different than economics. So those are gonna be averages again. So let's call mu A true average accounting major salary mu e true average economics major salary and then we'll have h o h a mu a, mu a, so equal to and not equal to now because it's a different than. If it was different than, they would not be equal, not equal to mu e. If they are not different, they will be equal, mu e. And of course, we could write those as mu a minus mu e equals zero or mu a minus mu e does not equal zero. All right, so that's setting up hypotheses when we're doing difference in means and difference in proportions tests. We went through some important side notes here. So we started with these questions and recognized that they were different because we have two unknowns. Side note one, that these sampling distributions look very similar to if we're looking at one unknown, like just X bar or P bar, but now we just want to recall, think about the fact we're looking at a difference in those estimates, and those come from bell curves, though. And those have different standard errors. So we have to remember to use a different formula once we're in the difference in means world. We talked about matched and unmatched samples. So you'll want to make sure to understand that because you will need to recognize which type of problem you're dealing with when you do 
the homework questions and possibly quiz questions too. And then we mentioned, hey, with differences like P1 bar minus P2 bar or X1 bar minus X2 bar, we can do confidence intervals just like we did before. Really, the only thing we have to account for is that we have a different standard error formula in both cases, whether we're doing sample averages or sample proportions. And then we came back to setting up the hypotheses now that we have two unknowns. All right, so I'll send these notes along with the video, and I'll see you guys soon.